Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of the Newcomer's Guide to Grim Dawn. My name is Winback and I will be taking you through it. This week is going to kick off a kind of mini-series inside the Newcomer series and we're going to be talking about the character classes in deeper detail. Now I'm just talking about the base classes here so there won't be any talk of the combinations like the Death Knight or the Witchblade, but I'll mention those in reference to certain parts of these videos. So as we go along, feel free to drop any comments, any questions, anything that you have that you want to know in these videos, and I will do my best to answer them. As always, though, it's a YouTube video, so feel free to like, comment, subscribe your heart out as you do, and let's get kicked off here. So to start us off, we're going to, uh, we're going to what I feel like is the most basic, but probably most efficient class of the group, which is our soldier. We're just going to make our way right down the tree that the game gives you anyway, so you can follow along and kind of expect the videos as they they come along through the menu. But our tried and true Beefcake Supreme, this soldier is not only effective in the early levels, but towards the later game, a, a lot of soldier skills will make characters extreme tanks. So when combined with mage classes like the Arcanist or the Demolitionist, you get a real solid mixture of survivability and damage. Uh, if you prefer something, or sorry, if, if you prefer to uh, simply stand directly in front of your enemies like a full tank, you can set up the soldier with either an Oathkeeper or a Necromancer, and from there you'll get some pretty nasty staying power. There are a lot of different ways to build the soldier class with other classes to make them just stand still and never die. Uh, but whew, before I dive uh, way too hard into this video as it is, let me just slap this big fat disclaimer on it right now. This video is based on my interactions, my experiences, and my gameplay. If that doesn't resonate with you, that's cool. Grim Dawn is huge in the freedom that it gives a player to choose, so don't feel like my comments are the end all here. Feel free to experiment, feel free to look at build guides, feel free to look at other videos. I'm just telling you what I resonate with in this game. Now that's out of the way, let's talk about the soldier's active abilities. We'll do all the active abilities, then we'll hit the passive abilities, and if we have a class that has summons, we'll hit those along the way as well. Uh, but since the soldier doesn't have any summons, we've just got actives and passives. Our first ability is the ever helpful but pretty boring Force Wave. Uh, Force Wave has a total of three modifiers along its skill path, but the basic ability is on a pretty short cooldown, and it's got a fair amount of range. It's a physical damage ability that sports a pretty nice stun on top of that damage, so it kind of checks all of the normal boxes. With enough points, Force Wave will clear out mobs well into the later acts of the game, if that isn't exciting enough for you though, you can grab yourself a two-handed weapon and pick up the Tremor modifier to alter the ability fundamentally. Now Tremor makes Force Wave spammable, takes that cooldown away, but it's going to reduce the damage significantly. The good news is that since it can be cast so often, it's also not going to eat as much energy. That's another thing the ability is going to do, reduce the energy cost, but it's going to double the stun duration as well. So you can CC things for literal eons while using the uh, Tremor boosted Force Wave. Now, Tremor isn't a must-take mastery, uh, but if your plan is to take Force Wave into your build into the late game, then I definitely suggest the modifying abilities that come along with it. Rending Force is the next mastery along the tree, and that is going to increase the range of Force Wave on top of giving you more physical damage and increased crit damage. Rending Force actually starts to spike Force Wave even further past its damage threshold, so once you've got the uh, Force Wave pretty much maxed out, you can start putting points into Rending Force to get even more damage out of it if you're starting to see some fall off on certain types of enemies. Now finally, the uh, Internal Trauma Mastery, the last one on the tree, which also shares the name with the damage type, is going to... Diversify the damage just a little bit uh, of the ability. So the mastery will add a damage over time factor in that it's going to give you both internal trauma and bleeding damage, uh, but it's also going to add an attack slow to the ability. So enemies that get hit by force wave are now going to attack slower if they don't immediately explode. 
Uh, I don't think this mastery is particularly necessary if you're going to drop uh, Tremor, but the damage isn't super insignificant, uh, and it squales, or sorry, it scales pretty well with just a couple points into it. So make your own decisions there. The only ones I think you really need for Force Wave are uh, Force Wave and then Rending Force to make it really good, but live your life. It's your build. The next active ability we get uh, early on is called Cadence. Uh, Cadence is an active ability in that it modifies your auto attacks, so it's pretty active there. I'd personally consider this a, uh, a passive ability, but the game has a big square box on it in the menus, so we'll, we'll call it an active. Uh, but being that Cadence activates off every third swing, that's probably just semantics. Uh, essentially, every third swing will add some flat physical damage as well as the damage that the item in your main hand does. So that means that if you have... Uh, if you're using Cadence, finding a high damage weapon for your main will... Uh, your main hand will pay off immediately. The main hand and off hand, I'm sure you figured that out already, but main hand is the weapon hand, and then uh, off hand is the hand that you put, like, books or shields or other stuff in. So that's how that's going to work. Uh, Cadence also works with ranged weapons, so don't be discouraged if you're not rocking a melee class, you can get just as much potential out of it with any type of weapon. The first mastery for Cadence is the ability called Discord, uh, not to be confused with the voice server, and will synergize really nicely with elemental classes. So Discord is going to add flat elemental damage as well as converting part of your physical damage to elemental damage as well. So if you're thinking maybe Tactician or Battle Mage uh, as your build, this ability would be pretty attractive to those classes. No, Tactician is uh, Inquisitor Soldier and Battle Mage is Arcanist Soldier. So both of those classes have some pretty serious elemental paths. So it's totally worth it, I think, for that ability. Uh, after that, you can dip into Fighting Form for some AoE as well as damage increasing on Cadence. Uh, you'll end up doing some flat bleeding damage while buffing your physical and increasing the radius of your actual swing if you're melee. Fighting form actually lets you hit multiple targets and it gets you better clear with just your autos if you're focusing on an auto build. Lastly, Deadly Momentum will be a simple damage modifier that affects all of your output every time that Cadence takes effect. The damage types are pretty narrow, but Deadly Momentum will give you a pretty nice little damage boost and it's, it's pretty consistent. I believe it's every four seconds. Uh, if you're not a fan of using auto attacks as your main type of damage, I definitely highly recommend Blade Arc. Blade Arc is our third active ability, but it's kind of similar to Fighting Form. Uh, Blade Arc doesn't have a cooldown and can be spammed pretty effectively, but it does have a 180 degree arc, so as long as the enemies are in front of you, they're going to get whacked. Uh, Blade Arc also adds some main hand damage. Again, same thing, main hand, not off hand. Bleeding damage, and a small chance to knock down enemies as well. The only downside is that the ability can only be used with a melee weapon, hence the Blade Arc name. It's not Gun Arc for a reason. Ah, similar to Force Wave and Tremor changes, uh, Clean Sweep actually has a, an equally big effect on Blade Arc. You'll give the ability a cooldown and remove a small amount of damage, but you'll get a pretty huge chunk of crit damage and increased crowd control. Really feels more like a preference than a big decision that you'll need to make, but the last mastery on the tree for Blade Arc is Laceration. Laceration is basically going to turn you into uh, a human blender. Uh, your attack radius is going to get much bigger. It's not a full 360 degrees, but it is very, very close. Uh, and on top of that, it's going to start adding more crit damage. Depending on whether or not you're going to use clean sweep, you could potentially have enormous amounts of crit damage with just blade arc and the, uh, the masteries buffing it. Now the soldier's fourth active ability is called Overguard, and this is the first kind of defensive active that we've got. Uh, Overguard stays active for 10 seconds, depending on the level, and it does require a shield, so it's only for those of, uh, those of us who love the thick boards. On top of that, though, the ability is going to increase absorption, give you some health regen, and mega buff your shield. 
Shield recovery, which is basically your, your block cooldown, the cooldown in which you can block, is reduced while also increasing the amount of damage that the shield can take just to drop the steaming hot cherry on top. This ability can also stun enemies that attack you through the effect of stun retaliation. It has a chance to basically uh, crowd control people who hit you, which is really neat, honestly. You don't see that uh, that retaliation type very often. You can also adjust overcard or overguard with Markovian's defense for a reduced ability cooldown and even more shield cooldown at the cost of about 15% of your damage. So if you are opting again for a more tanky class, this is totally worth it because your shield will be able to block more often. You can use the ability more often, but you lose a little bit of damage while the ability is active. The number five active on our list is going to be the one and only soldier mobility move, Blitz. This ability is going to require that you have a target to lock onto, but once you click on them, you will rocket towards them at the speed of sound while doing physical damage. It's also going to add in some weapon damage. The other thing to remember about Blitz, though, is that you can only use this ability if you have a melee weapon. So all you shooty guys out there are not going to be able to put, click on Blitz whatsoever. Ugh. Uh, the impact is also AoE, and it'll knock multiple targets down, giving some pretty rad CC on top of all of the mobility. Blitz is a 100% 10 out of 10 ability, and I would recommend it for any soldier build that doesn't have a better mobility option. Blitz also has one additional mastery called Blindside, which will increase its AoE and tack on some nice trauma damage. You'll also notice that it's going to reduce defensive ability on the targets that you hit, making it a great opener for your other attacks. Now, your last active ability is called Warcry. Unlike the Barbarian Shouts in games like Diablo, uh, you're actually going to deal damage with Warcry. Not only that, but tons of damage. Warcry is actually going to reduce the health of enemies by a percentage while taunting targets and reducing their damage. Uh, but the sad part about this ability is that it is much less effective against bosses. So if you'd rather have enemies run away from you instead of at you, you can pick up Terrify, which is the first modifier on the tree. If you grab this, you get a chance to send enemies fleeing and reduce their resistances for a short period of time. The reduction of the resistances is always a thing, but the uh, fleeing enemies is a chance thing. The last mastery for Warcry, though, is called Break Morale, and then Break Morale is going to do something really cool that we haven't actually talked about yet. This skill calls uh, this skill calls it Disruption, uh, but what that means is that any abilities that the enemies have will be locked out for a set duration. So if you're familiar at all with MOBAs or the typical way of thinking when it comes to these types of games, uh, you'll call it a silence. So basically you silence all of the enemy abilities near you, and all they'll have left is their auto attacks, and it goes for about three to four seconds, I believe. Uh, Break Morale also reduces physical resistance for enemies, meaning that any internal trauma damage in your build will be hitting even harder. So, physical resistance, if you weren't aware, is the only way to prevent internal trauma damage. Uh, armor does not affect internal trauma damage, even though trauma is the damage over time version of physical damage. So now that all of our actives are out of the way, we can start looking at the mountains of passive abilities that the soldier has. Most of them are very simple, but they have their own identities for lots of builds you can dream up. Now, Markovian's Advantage is the first up, and it fits nicely into heavy auto attack builds. This ability will activate off of any auto attacks, but only has a specific chance to do so. It's actually going to reduce the defensive ability of the target that gets hit, while also adding physical damage and your main hand to the attack. Since it's only hitting one target at a time, you could theoretically shred pretty tanky enemies with this ability and some speedy auto attacks if you're attacking on attack speed. Uh, but if we couple that with our next passive, which is Zolhan's technique, your autos will start intermit to intermittently reduce defensive ability and hit in an AoE. The big Z is going to give you a 180 degree attack arc while also slowing enemy attacks and dealing trauma damage. If you manage to get both of these abilities up to level 12, you could potentially have a very beefy auto attack every other swing. It is nuts how often you can use these two, so if you're playing something like a Soldier Nightblade and you get 
tons of attack speed, I would highly recommend Markovian's Advantage and Zolhan's Technique. Both of those are just base uh, passive abilities, no modifiers whatsoever to them, so we can move on to a Fighting Spirit. And it might not look like much at first glance, but this ability is going to scale extremely, extremely hard. Every time that you take damage, Fighting Spirit will activate, and once it does, you're going to get a multiplier to all of your damage, as well as buffing your offensive ability. With your Spirit ready to fight, not only are you going to have an easy time hitting things, you're also going to do nuts amounts of damage. And that's going to transition us on to Menhir's Will. We will get to see our first big defensive passive for the Soldier Tree, and one that I would argue is really important if you are planning on using the Soldier to maximum effectiveness in the endgame. Uh, I wish I could show you guys the ability, but there's not a great way to get a quick recording of it in a vacuum, so trust me when I say this ability should make you unkillable for about 10 seconds. Uh, once your health drops below a specific percentage, you'll instantly get a huge chunk of life, followed by extreme amounts of health regen. You need to have a shield or a two-hander, but man, is it worth it. So, if you want to be a tank, or you want to do the whole barbarian two-hander big stick kind of build, this is an awesome ability. Now, military conditioning is your next passive, and it is quite literally just stats, extra stats. It's going to give you physique and health, both in percentage form, uh, and it's not fancy, but it's certainly not bad. Physique is going to keep you alive when it comes to late gaming, so yeah, health and physique, always good stats. Shield training follows that, but again, it is uh, just passive stats for your shield. You're going to reduce the cooldown, get more block chance, uh, as well as increase the chances that you get to block stuff. Again, super not flashy, but that's kind of the soldier's deal. Uh, veterancy, Decorated Soldier, and Scars of Battle are going to be your next three stat-boosting passives. Uh, they're not on the same tree. They're all their own passives, but, you know, they, they kind of fall in the same category. Veterancy gives you enormous boosts to health, regen, and constitution uh, while reducing physique requirements for armor, so you can essentially put on bigger armor sooner. Uh, decorated Soldier is simply giving us some damage in the physical and trauma categories while bumping up our elemental and slow resistances. And then Scars of Battle is going to increase armor absorption and provide a large chunk of bleeding resistance as well as some CC reduction. All in all, this whole row of passives is pretty normy, but uh, can't be understated in value. Stats are always, always good. The good news is we can move on to the cool passives now, so let's start with Field Command. Uh, field Command, this is an aura that is going to spread bunches of offensive ability, defensive ability, and armor absorption in a huge radius. If you take it one step further with the mastery along the tree called Squad Tactics, you're going to get a massive bump in attack speed, casting speed, and all damage. Field Command is amazing for pet builds or if you have a bunch of friends playing with you and you guys are maybe focused more on... Um, you know, tanky or melee classes, this is going to be super helpful. Super, super helpful. Uh, now, Counter-Strike is your next up toggle on passive with a bunch of cool effects. This ability has got a percentage chance to activate upon getting hit, but once you get the activation radius, uh, or once you get the activation going, the radius is going to explode with weapon damage, retaliation damage, physical damage, physical retaliation, and bleeding. Uh, the ability itself is an AoE nuke that simply relies on being punched a couple times. But if you're looking for something a little more spicy than that, you can pick up Oleron's Rage. This one is an exclusive skill though, so remember if you choose this one, you can't choose other exclusive skills. Uh, now Rage is going to do the normal stuff in buffing your physical, pierce, and trauma damage. Whew. Sorry, just got distracted by... The game, we're getting ready to go into the uh, Logorian's uh, boss chamber and end the base game, essentially. Um, but where was I? Alright, oh, uh, so on top of increasing physical pierce and trauma damage, uh, you're going to get a percent percentage increase to offensive ability. Meaning that the higher you stacked your offensive ability, the higher the increase is going to get from this ability. So the cherry on top is some wicked move speed, 
And I don't know if you've noticed, but in a game like Grim Dawn, where walking places is the main form of travel, I'd rather be speedy than wearing cement shoes. Now, the very final passive ability in the soldier kit is going to be the, uh, well, the exact opposite of Oleron's Rage. It's called Menhir's Bulwark. It's going to be a defensive ability that synergizes insanely well with Counter-Strike, Menhir's Will, and Veterancy. Uh, but Menhir's Bulwark is actually going to give you health regen, physical damage, healing percentage, sorry, a percentage of healing increase. So your, your heals are going to be doing more healing. Uh, and it's going to increase your retaliation damage as well. Interestingly enough, uh, this will actually increase the duration of stuns in your build on top of that. So that is not a stat I see super often, but really cool all the same and an incredibly powerful ability, but it is also an exclusive skill. So if you are going to take this one, you can't take Oleron's Rage. And the giant mouth beast has been felled. Just literally covered in mouths and tentacles, and we burned him with some mines that don't die. Luckily, since this is normal, I can just face tank the end of the base game boss for literal eons. If we were in something like uh, Ultimate, uh, we would have to do a little bit more dip diving and dodging, but as it stands in normal, the uh, the Logorian isn't really the, the scariest bad guy in the entire universe. But yeah, that is it for all the soldier abilities in this video, and that is actually it for the base game of Grim Dawn. So what we're going to do tomorrow is actually talk about the Demolitionist. Moving right on down the um, class tree, or the I guess the class options is probably more apt. But um, yeah. So that'll take us into the expansion for Ashes of Malmoth. Uh, another thing to mention to you as well, when you beat the Loghorian and you come to talk to Inquisitor Creed, he will give you a level 50 legendary. Uh, it's random, so no matter what you do, once you get this done, you'll get a pretty big purple item from him. That's not doing anything for me that I need. Venom Lash isn't going to do anything for my kit, but still, I can throw it in a box, slap it on another class, have a good time, and I'm about 8 levels shy of level 50 anyway, so it's not a huge deal for me. My build is actually working pretty well for me all things considered still and once we get into ashes of melmoth xp is going to start rocketing upwards but that is it for this video thanks so much for hanging out and i will see you guys next time <laughs>